Our final speaker um, really needs no introduction because Sandra Knapp has been instrumental in um, enabling the BSBI to hold the an exhibition meeting at the Natural History Museum um, and is a, a stalwart behind the scenes in making sure that everything happens for those meetings. And indeed, she and Fred Rumsey enabled our first AGM um, of the England group um, to take place at the Natural History Museum last year. And hopefully we will be returning there in the not too distant future, once we can all uh, travel to different places and assemble together. It's gonna be terrifying at first, but for the moment we're, we're Zooming. Um, so I will hand over to, to Sandy to talk to us about the Solanaceae. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna share my screen and hope that this all works perfectly. Um, Jonathan asked me to talk about Solanaceae, and I thought, well, you know, I know so little about British botany, and actually, there aren't that many really interesting. Well, all Solanaceae are interesting, but there aren't that many interesting Solanaceae in in England. So I thought I would just tell you a bit about nightshades and introduce you to the extraordinary diversity of of the groups that there that we do have in England elsewhere in the world. So um, this is just my particular journey and I'll tell you a bit about the family first and then a bit about about Solanum, which is the largest genus and then a little bit about this particular clade that I'm working on at the moment. So people often think of Solanaceae as being potatoes. That's what you, you mentioned. You mentioned Solanaceae and either people think of deadly nightshades or they think of potatoes. But Solanaceae is much more than just potatoes. It's a pretty small, it's a medium sized plant family. It's not a monster like the orchids or the daisies. It's only got about 4,000, 4,500 species in it. So it's, so it's not very big. It's about the size of the floor of Britain or Texas. And there are, but there are 103 genera. But what's very odd about the Solanaceae is that almost half of the species diversity in the family is contained in a single genus, which is the genus Solanum, which has about 1,200 plus species. And I'll tell you a bit about how we know that in a minute. There's a couple of other genera which are quite big, which are Cestrum and Lysianthes. Um, Cestrum, you've probably seen in greenhouses. Cestrum fasciculatum is widely grown. It has beautiful red flowers. There's a really good one in the in the tempered house at Kew. Nolana and Haltamata are two genera, which one species of Nolana is widely cultivated, and um, nobody cultivates Haltamata. But there, people are discovering loads and loads of new species in those in those genera. So they're creeping up there in the in the table. And then you go on down to there are several genera that just have a single species. And one of these is Latua, which you can see here, which is a which is an endemic to the coast of Chile which people at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh are bringing into cultivation. It's an absolutely beautiful plant, highly toxic, but very beautiful. So Solanaceae grow in the most extraordinary range of habitats. They grow everywhere from the driest coastal deserts of Western South America, this is the Atacama Desert in Northern Peru, to the very high elevation mountains above 5,000 meters in both the Andes and in the Himalaya. They grow across the volcanic, the dry temperate temperate forests across the volcanic, central volcanic belt in Mexico is highly diverse in Solanaceae. But their real peak of diversity comes on the eastern slopes of the Andes in South America, where, they, where the peak of species diversity occurs between about 1,000 and 2,500 meters, where there's just a huge amount of rainfall, very, very wet, rich volcanic soils. The family also, though, occurs in Africa, in the savannas of East Africa, and also is highly diverse, which I'll talk about very briefly, but other people may have heard me talk about this before, is highly diverse in central Australia, in the deserts of Australia. So, so anywhere you go, except Antarctica, there'll be a Solanaceae there that you can make friends with. So many, many of the species are, are understory shrubs. So they occur in the, in the dark forest understories of these tropical rainforests. And this is a new species of the genus Brunfelsia, which we found recently in Bahia in Brazil. And that's a typical sort of Solanaceae habitat is, is there sitting as a shrub under, under the forest. But they also can be crummy little 
plants that are in pavements. Um, this is a, a gravel pavement um, riverbed. You can see this is the plant right here. This is Camisaraca villosa, which is in Pecos County, Texas in the US. This is what it looks like close up. It's really rather beautiful, but, um, but these are just small little prostrate plants in, in dry areas. Or you can get things that are rather large and tree like this is Selenum denikensi from Marsabit in, in Kenya. So, so not only do you get loads and loads of different habitats, but you also get loads and loads of different body shapes, life form differences. So this is, this is in part, this is in part the reason for the success of the family worldwide. So the way that I approach, I, I suppose I'm probably what one would characterize as the last of the old school taxonomists. So I work on two levels. I work at naming things and figuring out what taxa are. And I follow this, this um, you know, aphorism of Linnaeus that if you don't know the names of things, the knowledge of them is lost too. So the names of things are very important and getting, the, getting a name that can accurately represent what we see as variation in nature is what my primary goal is in doing my basic taxonomy on the Solanaceae worldwide. But I also work on looking at evolutionary relationships. And the Solanaceae are a really interesting family from the point of view of evolutionary relationships, in part because so many of them are weeds and so many of them are used by humans, that sometimes our knowledge of where things occur and how they're related unless we're using modern techniques like DNA sequencing, can actually get mixed up with our human overlay of taking things all over the world. So this is a, a phylogenetic framework for the nightshades, which we published in 2013, and we're just, we're just doing another one, um, which will, the paper's being written as we speak. And that this goes from, from here, these kind of early branching lineages, goes up here, goes to here, and goes to here. And as I said earlier, selenum, is half the species diversity of the genus. And it's also half of the kind of evolutionary diversity of the genus. So it's not just about numbers, it's also about ev evolution. And it's about, it's about um, also very recent radiations, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. And um, I, can I can ask questions, like you can, I can answer questions about that later. But I'm gonna start um, with these early branching lineages and just show you some examples of the incredible diversity of Solanaceae um, there is out there. And the first of these I want to show you is Schizanthus. Now Schizanthus was, is, a, is, um, is also often called the butterfly orchid or the poor man's orchid. And these are annual plants, which we often plant in our gardens. And, um, and these, are, these are found in coastal Chile and the adjacent Andes in Argentina. So these are a real Southern, Southern hemisphere genus and they have extraordinarily beautiful flowers. And for a long time, these were placed in the snapdragon family, the Scrofulariaceae, until it became clear that actually they belonged with the Solanaceae. And they're one of the very first branching lineages in the Solanaceae. Now this doesn't mean, because they're a first branching lineage, this doesn't mean that, that um, floral strangeness like this has been lost in the rest of the family. It's just that there's been quite a lot of change along this particular lineage leading to these extraordinarily beautiful flowers. So these are all annuals. Another set of, um, of plants which are down there in those, in those early branching lineages in the family are the petunias. Now petunias again are Southern South American. So Solanaceae, you can kind of see the pattern here, is a Gondwanan family. This is something that, that, that originated almost certainly in the ancient supercontinent of Gondwana. Petunias are, the highest diversity of petunias is in, is in Southeastern Brazil. And there are some extraordinarily beautiful ones with little tiny flowers and little round leaves. This is Petunia altiplana, which was described by a Japanese botanist called Toshi, Toshiro Ando. But petunias are important for a, a number of other reasons. Is you know, Arabidopsis is often thought of as being like the lab rat plant of all time. Everybody does experiments on Arabidopsis. But actually a lot of, a lot of what we know about color in flowers actually comes from petunias. And it was in petunias that microRNAs, which are the things that regulate the expression of genes in particular cells, was first described in these petunias, which have these variegated flowers, where in the white areas, the microRNAs are suppressing the expression of the anthocyanin genes. So petunias, the cultivated petunia, has really become a, a lab rat of its own, but for slightly different things like, like flower morphology and particularly for the expression of color and the evolution of color in flowers. 
Now, European Solanaceae, as I said earlier, are, are relatively few and far between, but they actually are pretty evil. So you can imagine why people weren't that keen on things like potatoes and tomatoes when they first came to Europe, because the native European Solanaceae all actually have pretty bad reputations. This is the deadly nightshade, Atropa belladonna, which has, I think they're absolutely beautiful flowers. They're gorgeous flowers, but the fruits are beautiful black and shiny and very tempting to eat. But eating them, if I ate one, I would probably just be a little bit sick, but if a child ate one, it could be quite dangerous. So these plants are, are, um, are dangerous and, and have been implicated in all kinds of interesting practices. And among these is witchcraft. So the association of Solanaceae with witchcraft is, is, a, is, a, is a long one. And, and one of the interesting things that people have, have shown or have, have historians have shown is that um, descriptions of witch, witchcraft almost always have to do with flying. They almost always involve people flying and moving from place to place by magic means, by flying through the air. And um, uh, Andres de Laguna, who was a Spanish court physician in the 16th century and, and attempting to kind of convince the Inquisition that, these, that the, witches weren't, the witches were not real. He, he um, did an experiment with, a, with a, a couple who had said that they were practicing witches. And he said that they had a pot full of a certain green ointment composed of herbs such as hemlock, nightshade, henbane, and mandrake nightshade, henbane, and mandrake, all being Solanaceae, that they had, um, had smeared on themselves and that they had remained locked in their house, but said that they had flown throughout the countryside. And so you can see this is the kind of imagery that you get associated with witchcraft in, um, in, uh, in Europe. So Solanaceae had a really bad reputation. Now these plants, um, like the mandrake, which is probably the most famous one, are poisonous and have these kind of um, psychoactive flying effects because they have high concentrations of things called tropane alkaloids. And tropane alkaloids are, are um, ring compounds that have a nitrogen in them. So these tropane compounds actually cause in, in, your, in your brain, in one's brain, cause this sensation of flying. And anybody who's ever been a non-smoker and smoked a cigar will know exactly what I'm talking about is this, this sensation of kind of up, out of the body experience is due to the kind of the neurological effects of these tropane alkaloids. And mandrake has, ha, is very high in these, as um, there are other things associated with mandrakes as well, that lots and lots of old wives tales. So not only this association with witchcraft, but the idea that if you pull the mandrake up, mandrakes have long tap roots. This is a picture of a mandrake from um, Joseph Banks's uh, manuscript version of a copy of Dioscorides, from, who was a first century AD physician um, in, in Rome. And he says uh, in Gerard's Herbal, which was published in 1597, it was one of the first herbals published in the English language. He says, there are these ridiculous tales of this plants, whether they're old wives or crazy surgeons and physic mongers, I don't. And, they, and he says that um, there's this story that if you tie, if you tie, if you tie it, you have to tie a dog to pull the plant out of the ground because it shrieks and would kill you unless you, um, if you did it yourself. So you can see where the kind of idea of putting earmuffs on while, where, while repotting the mandrakes comes from in Harry Potter. So pretty accurate botany there from JK Rowling. But he basically says all of this is all of these dreams you shall henceforth cast out of your books and memory, knowing this, that they are all and every part of them false and most untrue. And he goes on to suggest that, that the reason that these myths spread about mandrakes is because um, people selling mandrakes wanted to keep a monopoly and didn't want everybody out there harvesting mandrakes. So mandrakes have old wives tales about them, but they also have some, some, some real uses in, in things like witchcraft. But probably the most commonly used drug amongst human beings is also Solanaceae. Well, except alcohol, of course, which is different. But, the, but um, tobacco, Nicotiana tobaccum, is probably the most commonly used legal drug um, amongst human populations. And tobacco is a uh, is a plant of the Andes. And this is a, a picture many years ago of my colleague Moises, Moises Mendoza and a very early um, 
cultivar of tobacco that we collected in a Bolivian in a Bolivian village and turned out to be really interesting interesting um, cytologically. Now tobacco is really interesting because tobacco itself, the cultivated tobacco, is a polyploid, an allo polyploid, which means essentially that two the genomes of two species come together to create a third, which is double the chromosome number. So you can see that, you can see that there's a bit of, it's kind of intermediate, isn't it? But if you squint, that it's intermediate between those two species, Nicotian and Tobacco. But you can look at the, at the chromosome squashes, which are dyed with um, genomic in situ hybrid, hybridization to show the two different chromosome sets in different colors. And here's the chromosome set from Sylvestris, which is yellow, and the chromosome set from Nicotiana tomentosiformis. And you can see that these two chromosome sets are both present in tobacco, which has double the number of chromosomes, and they're starting to mix together. And one of the things that Andrew Leach and, and Jung Lim found was that actually these, this mixing um, accelerates until about after about 10 million years, if we're dating all of these by their molecular clock, after about 10 million years, you can no longer distinguish the two genome sets. So they become diploidized, but with double the chromosome number. And Mark Chase at Kew and his colleagues are now working on a really interesting lineage of, of Nicotianas in Australia, where these species are starting to lose chromosome numbers. So they're starting to not only, they have an allopolyploid origin, but they're also now beginning to lose chromosome numbers. So watch that space. It's a very interesting story. So now I just want to move to Selenum, which is actually my, my first love. My, my real love in, in Solanaceae is Selenum. This is Selenum whale and I. I put the names of all of these, of all of these species in these slides just because I know from um, interacting with, with BSBIers that actually people like knowing the names of things. So I put all the names in here with their authors as well. And I probably have misspelled some, so please forgive me if I have. So Selenum has always been a really big genus. So it was one of Linnaeus's largest genera in Species Plantarum in 1753, where he had 23 species. And it grew over time. Michel-Félix Dunal was the head of the, of the Montpellier Botanic Garden in Southern France and was a Solanaceae expert. And he um, had a had a, a, a book called um, Histoire médicale et économique des Solanum in 1813, in which he described 109, 199 species of Solanum. By 1816, that number had almost doubled to 331. And it's at this time that the actual exploration of the Andes with the with the expedition of Humboldt and Bonpland and um, some of the other people who went to the Andes started, and that's when the real diversity of Solanaceae became um, became apparent. And by 1852, in the Great Prodromus of um, of De Candolle, Dunal Dunal's Solanaceae treatment had almost a thousand species. In 2001, Armando Hunsicker, one of the great solanologists from Argentina. He reckoned there were about a thousand species of Selenum. And when we began our big study of Selenum in 2004, by 2011, we reckoned that there would probably be about 1,500 species of Selenum when, when we got to the, well, the end, whatever the end is. But actually one of the real problems in the taxonomy of Selenum in assigning names to things is synonymy. And this is, this is a real problem. So people often think of people like me out there in the jungle kind of stomping around and finding new species all the time. And yeah, that's fun and great and everything. And I'll show you some of that in a minute. But actually one of the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis is just work out what the synonymy is, work out what, which names apply to the same ch chunk of variation in nature that we want to call a species. And in Selenum, there's 6,000, around 6,200 names. We currently have 1,200 plus accepted names that we are, we are saying these are the species we want to recognize, which means we have almost 5,000 synonyms, which means there's an 80% synonymy rate. So that means 80% of the names in the genus are actually synonyms. There are things that have been described again. And a lot of this comes from Northern Europe where lots and lots of things, little tiny variations of things get described over and over again. And when one takes a global view, then, then it's clear that all of those things pertain to the same taxon that we're going to give a name to. So we keep track of all of these names in a database, which, is, which we call Solanaceae source. And I'll, just, I'll, I'll show you a bit more about that in a minute. So Solanum's always been big. But Selenum has got much bigger. 
recently. So there was that big 500 species jump between Hunsaker and, and the, our planetary biodiversity inventory, Selenum estimate. And this is partly because there are a lot of genera which are a little bit different, which have been segregated previously. Now you can see this, these are all pictures of what I call Selenum. And you can see that they all have the same general kind of flower body plan. There's, a, there's five petals and they're kind of joined in some places and a bit split. Um, and their stamens are all uh, clustered in the middle and there are five of them and there are various different shapes. But they all, if you squint, those all look pretty much the same. But actually some of the variants on those have been called different genera. And so as part of our works, this one was called Androceros. This is a really interesting one that has a feeding anther um, for bees. Um, tomatoes were, were traditionally called Lycopersicon. Linnaeus called them Selenum, but um, Philip Miller at the Chelsea Physic Garden decided this genus Selenum was too big. So he made a new genus, Lycopersicum, and put the potatoes and tomatoes into it. Siphomandra are interesting um, South American shrubs which have oil glands on the back. Normania has a, has a funny shape. Triguira has a bit of a funny shape. But all of these things, when you actually looked at the DNA evidence, all of these things belonged to a very highly supported, what we call monophyletic selenum. So this was in 2007 when we first started to do this work with DNA. And we realized that all of these segregate genera actually didn't make any sense. And what we needed to do was to recognize a much larger selenum. Now this was highly controversial in some areas, particularly with the tomato people and the tomato growing industry. So you can see here, here are the major groups of, um, of selenum and I'll show you another kind of view of this in a minute. But you can see here that these are the, what we call the out groups. So these are the other genera that, with which we compare these. And these, all of these clades have 100% support. So really a large selenum is highly supported by the evidence, despite the minor variations in the flowers that there are in some of the species. Now, how do you recognize a genus? Now, recognizing a genus is not necessarily easy because it's largely a construct of the human mind. So different people have different ways of cutting a tree. The tree, the relationships is real and that's evidence. But where you cut it very much depends on how you recognize something as a genus or not. So we chose to cut the tree here and have a monophyletic selenum, all of which was called selenum. Somebody else might have decided to cut the tree here, in which case we would have this monophyletic group because we're aiming for monophyly. That's, that's what we're doing. All the descendants of a common ancestor belong together. Here we would have a group that would have to have a name called Androceros or Siphomandra. Well, Androceros is older, so it would have to be Androceros. This little clade here would be called Selenum. That's great. Selenum nigrum is the type of Selenum. This, the potatoes would all have to be in the genus Lycopersicum, and there were a whole bunch of things that didn't have names. So we felt that the most parsimonious way to look at this and the most sensible way to look at it was to actually define things as a monophyletic selenum, which was controversial but at the beginning. But now all tomato growers and tomato people working on um, the, the um, biotechnology with tomatoes all now call the cultivated tomato selenum lycopersicum, and there is no longer a problem at all. So oftentimes changes in names can be upsetting in the very short term, but actually in the long term, they tell us that we've learned something about that particular um, group of organisms. They, they, they tell us that, we, that we've learned something more about them. So we define a monophyletic selenum. And selenum, like the rest of the Solanaceae, has this extraordinary variety of different kinds of, of habitats, which basically parallel the ones I showed you earlier for selenum, but also in terms of plant body size. This is a tiny selenum called selenum wedellii, which grows in the high Andes above 5,000 meters in, in northern Argentina. And that's my thumb there. So this is a tiny little plant, about a centimeter and a half long, which has a bud, a flower, and a fruit. So it's basically living fast and dying young. And at the other end of the spectrum, there are trees, tree selenums. This is selenum lycocarpum in, um, in southeastern Brazil. And this, is a, this can grow to be quite a large tree, four to five to six meters tall, but it also has these extraordinarily large fruits, which are, which are the, size of, um, well, the size of a baby's head. 
and they're eaten by maned wolves, which are an endangered species in, in South America and, and occur in the same habitats as, as the wolf fruit. And these wolves eat these fruits to worm themselves because they contain psilocydines, particular alkaloids, which kill intestinal worms. So these, so um, I used to go looking for the seeds of these by following wolf scat around in Paraguay, um, which is quite fun, and then pick them out and then grow them. So huge numbers of different kinds of life forms. And selenums can basically be divided into two big chunky things. We have here in these early branching lineages, what we call a paraphyletic grade. So this is not all the descendants of a common ancestor because um, of the way the tree is constructed, but these are the non-spiny selenums. So these are the ones that we might know from Europe like selenum nigrum or the potato or the tomato. These are, these are, these are plants without prickles. Here marked by the star, all of this, all of this right here these are, this is a monophyletic group. So these are all the descendants of a common ancestor. And these are the spiny selenums. Now these technically aren't spines. These are prickles because they're outgrowths of the epidermis, but we traditionally call these spiny selenums. And the spiny selenums are half the species diversity in selenum in this monophyletic group. So you can see here, I've circled with colors, different colors, where, where in South America, where in the, where in the world these things are um, spe most species diverse. And blue is the Andes, um, green is Argentina, uh, red is the Amazon and Brazil, yellow is Mexico. And this big group here, which is again, another monophyletic group. So all the descendants of a common ancestor are the spiny selenums, which occur in what we call the old world. So not South America, not the Americas. So outside of the Americas. So that's interesting. Huge amounts of diversity in the spiny selenums occur not in South America, but outside South America. But species diversity in selenum, species richness in selenum is highly concentrated in South America. You can look at these maps and red means lots and blue means some but not huge numbers, right? So, so if you look at species richness of selenum all over the world, you can see that it's concentrated in the Andes and in southeastern Brazil. So in basically a ring around the Amazon. The Amazon is fantastically dull for Solanaceae. They tend to like volcanic soils. So a ring around the Amazon for species for species richness. With a PhD student, um, at Susie Echeverria Londoño, we recently published a paper looking at diversification, which means the speciation rates of, of selenums around the world. So we applied these, these algorithms. And the thing that really, really surprised us is you'd expect there to be the highest diversification where there's the highest species richness. But actually the highest diversification in selenum is in the old world dry areas, particularly concentrated in the dry center of Australia. So the net diversification rates actually mirror the species richness rates in selenum, which is a very interesting, an interesting result. And I could give a whole talk about that, but I just thought that was something that was worth pointing out is that sometimes these plants which are highly su successful at invading new habitats often are those which can invade arid habitats and take advantage of drying. So that may tell us something about the future of biodiversity as the world dries up with climate change. Now, just because the net diversification is higher in the old world in Australia and Africa, that doesn't mean that there aren't new species being discovered all the time. And South America is actually where all these new species are being discovered. This is one that um, we described mm, two years ago in 2019. This is related to the wolf fruit, but this is a prostrate plant, a completely prostrate huge plant which snaking long stems that go along the ground, which is why we called it Selenum medusae after the, the, um, the, uh, the locks of Medusa, the snake-like locks of Medusa. It also has a very large fruit like the wolf fruit, but completely different um, pubescence and, and seed morphology and everything. So it's, it's, a, it's highly restricted to a particular granitic outcropping in the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil, so highly endangered. Other new species are being await, awaiting being described. This is one that I really want him to call this, the ventiladora. It's the fan, we call it the fan thing because it looks like one of those ceiling fans with the calyx lobes sticking out. This is one again from, from um, Southeastern Brazil, which is being described by a colleague of mine, Leandro Giacomin, who is currently working in the Amazon. So lots and lots of new species being discovered 
and particularly in places like Brazil, which turns out to be highly species rich in that kind of southeastern Brazilian area, even though people have been collecting there for a long time, many things are always discovered. And field work is really, really important in, in, in looking for new taxa and thinking about the distribution of things. What's important from our point of view in understanding diversity and distribution in Solanaceae, in Solanum, is to go places where people haven't necessarily been before. Because oftentimes these days, what people will do is go back to where someone has collected a plant before, because they can, then they can see it. And of course, we all want to do that. You know, we'd like to go back to where someone has seen a rare orchid or, you know, um, but actually you, you gain more by going places that people haven't been, like along road verges that Jonathan was talking about, you know, that you can go along those road verges and find some really exciting stuff. So these are colleagues, Paul Gonzalez and Tina Sarkinen in Peru, but actually many, many discoveries of new taxa in Selenum in, last, in the last decade have come from work in herbaria particularly in herbaria, small local herbaria, which keep very good collections and records of local areas, because it's often students and local botanists who collect those things um, that don't make it to big places like the Natural History Museum or Kew, but that, but that those, those herbarium records can, can reveal diversity. So I think of, of the last 10 species that I've described in, in Solanum in the last few years, eight of those have come entirely from herbarium records and have not been first found by me in the field. They've been found in the herbarium. And then either we've described them just from herbarium specimens or we've tried to go back because sometimes going back is uh, prohibitively expensive. And actually in the last year, it's been impossible. So herbaria are actually real frontiers for species discovery in everything as well as in Selena. So why are we doing this? So what are we doing? So in 2004, we got a very large National Science Foundation grant to create a world monograph. Monograph being, you know, the one piece of writing that tells you everything you wanted to know and some things you didn't about a particular group to create a world monograph of Selenum. And monographs tend to be published, you know, in books and, um, and that's great and everything. But we decided that we would publish this monograph, not only in books that people can use, but also on, on, on the internet to have all of the species descriptions on the internet that people could use, have images that people could look at to, to kind of make this more openly accessible to people. So we started out by, by um, revising, lightly revising things that we consider to be modern monographs of, of particular taxa. And if you look at this sort of phylogeny of Selenum over here, which you'll recognize as being the one from Tina's paper, the green ones are, are ones where we've basically done monographs and the purple are ones where we haven't, are clades or big major groups where we haven't done monographs. Now you can see we're making pretty good progress. Mind you, this one only has three species, but this one has quite a lot. So, so we're getting there with monographing these particular groups within Selenum. The other thing that we've done on Solanaceae source, and we just put this up recently, is because Selenum is so big, it's really hard to get a handle on, on how you would identify something that you might might find or a picture that someone might send you. And so what, what um, we did with uh, Rebecca Hilgenhoff, who did this as her master's thesis at the University of Edinburgh, is she created a multi-access key to all of the groups, all of the species groups of Selenum. So all of these species groups, plus some slightly more um, in-depth ones within things like the Pitota clade. So, so, there's, a, so there's this multi-access key, which you start out with characters like geographic distribution and prickles, and you can just choose characters and it, and it makes it ever smaller. The, the key gets ever smaller. So I'd really encourage people to kind of map with it because um, we, we're, we're really anxious to have people use it and tell us how to make it better because, um, and it can be found, the URL is there at the bottom of the screen, um, solanacsource.org for that key. And the, the tab right here, identification keys, takes you into those, into those keys. So we're trying to do this as much online as we possibly can, which means that we're kind of behind sometimes with updating things online because there's not very many of us who are doing this, but it's a way of kind of involving more people if we possibly can. So I'm now gonna to talk to you just a little bit here about, about the group that I'm working on in particular. And this is, this is one of those last groups that has not been monographed. And these are what we call the M clade. 
Now, this is a group which is stuck together in all of our phylogenies of, of um, selenum ever since we first started doing molecular phylogenies. And this, this, um, this figure over here on the, on the right hand of the screen is looking at the phylogeny of selenum using three different types of DNA data. So this one, this one which you'll recognize, that circle one, is, is 800 species of selenum. So getting on for, not all of them, but getting on for quite a few of them, um, using traditional um, DNA sequencing techniques of particular regions of the genome. And this is the same ones that we used when we created our 2013 phylogeny. And you basically get the same, the same groups. We decided to, to also look at the, at the phylogeny, looking at the whole plastid, plastid genome, the whole genome of the chloroplast. So as you know, there's in, in every cell, in every plant cell, there's the nuclear genome. And then each, each chloroplast has its own genome as well. And it's separate and it's a circle. So you can sequence that whole, whole circle. So this is a, and it usually rep, represents the maternal lineage. And this is a, based on all of plastomes. And then this is based on a, a much larger, what's called bait set. And the reason we did this with these three different um, types of techniques is because we, we kept getting, no matter how many taxa we added or how many sequences we used, we kept getting areas of the backbone, this, this area of the phylogeny, you know, where, where the major groups diverge, we get the same major groups every time, but the relationships between those groups were not clear. So we would have places where we couldn't say, this is most closely related to this. So we were trying to figure out about, about why that, if that was an artifact of the regions of DNA we were using or what. And it turns out probably, to make a long story short, it's due to what we call hard polytomies, is there are some places where you just can't work out the relationships. And we need to think of how we're going to deal with this going forward, doing studies of macroecology and macroevolution, looking at broader patterns. If this is the case, that not everything is perfectly bifurcatingly branched, then we need to think about that. But I'll let Edeline, Edeline gives a great talk about this. So maybe someone will see that one day. I want to talk about this M clay, which is the thing that I'm, I'm involved in now with an international group of people doing the last one of the last of these big monographs. Now the M clay consists of those two groups, which actually people in the, you in the BSBI will recognize as being things that we have here in England. The Morelloid clade, which, is, um, which contains Selenum nigrum and its pals, and the Dulcamaroid clade, which contains Selenum dulcamara and its pals. And you can see here's the Morelloid clade, which is closely related to the Dulcamaroids, but there's another one included here as well. And what I thought I would do is because these are basically the two we have in England, so you'd think, oh, this is really boring. This is kind of, there's not a lot of diversity there. But what I want to just canter you through is some of the diversity in this, in this clade and some of the extraordinary weirdness that there is in this M clade in South America. So looking at the Dulcamaroids. Now the Dulcamaroid clade, I monographed this in, a, in an open access monograph in 2013. And the Dulcamaroid clade, which contains our pal, the woody nightshade, Selenum dulcamara is 45 species of shrubs and vines, and they are in two big groups, one of which is Eurasian and North American, and the other of which is South American. And here's a few examples of some of these things. This is Selenum endoedinium from high elevation um, Argentina. It has very beautiful dark purple flowers. Selenum dulcamaroides, a huge canopy vine from Mexico. Selenum McBridei, which is a, a shrub that grows at 6,000 meters in the Andes in Bolivia and had long been um, misidentified as either a member of the Jesneriaceae or the Ericaceae until someone actually looked close enough to see that it actually has a totally classic little selenum flower, just a bit weird looking. Selenum laxum, which lots of people here grow in their gardens and is often called selenum jasminoides, but the right name for that is selenum laxum, which is from southeastern Brazil, and selenum liratum from China, which looks a lot like Selenum dulcamara, but has much tinier flowers and often has these black anthers. So a lot of diversity in that clade. But what was really interesting about this is you could tell a member of this clade really easily because the pedicels are all inserted in little cups that arise from the inflorescence axis. So there's a little cup and the, and the pedicel is in there, which we call this the pedicel sleeve. And that's completely diagnostic across the entire dulcamaroid clade. 
So all docomoroids have this. And I'll show you something in a minute and you can you can guess what, what clade it what clade it's in. So there's the docomoroids. So we've monographed those. And the next of these clades, which is a new grouping from this, this most recent phylogeny, which is um, which is quite exciting because it 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 means that we're discovering something new with these new DNA sequences, is something that's called the um Edeline has called it the Van Ans clade, the the um, the um well, this is what she's called it. And, and it, it's composed of a bunch of quite disparate groups, one of which we've monographed, which is the non -Afri African non-spiny, which is this ANS, African non-spiny. So this is um, Valdiviense, uh, Australia, Normania, African non-spiny clade. So the African non-spiny clade consists of um, one species, which is widespread across continental Africa, and then 15 or 16 species, which are endemic to Madagascar and are huge canopy vines. I mean, they're this big around, great big canopy lianas. They look superficially a lot like the dolcomaroids, a lot like Selenum dolcomara, but they aren't actually most closely related to the dolcomaroids. A species that I treated as a member of the docomaroid clade in 2013, but it turns out to be a kind of loner on its own with another with another species from Chile is Selenum valdiviense, which occurs on the on the uh, western slopes of the Andes in Chile in the Nothofagus forest, is a, 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 a beautiful little plant and very isolated, not, not closely related to anything except these other, other groups. Selenum liciniatum is an example of an entirely Australian clade. People have probably seen Liciniatum. It's established itself all over London in, in squares. It's the kangaroo apple. And um, it will it comes up and comes and goes and it's very easy to cultivate. It's, um, it's all over the place in London at the minute. Lots of plants have been killed by the recent frost, but it's still all over London. And there's about, there's about 13 species of these, which are completely confined to Australia. If you include New Guinea, well, New Guinea is actually part of Australia, but there's one species in New, in New Guinea. And then these two plants were always, these are two of these um, Selenum lineages, which used to be their own genera. So this is Selenum trisectum from Madeira and another species called Selenum nava, which is from the Canaries. And they used to be called the genus, the genus Normania, and they were called a different genus because they have these sort of slightly strange anthers with sort of horns on them. And another species which occurs in southern Spain and across the Straits of Hercules in Morocco, very endemic to that area, is used to be in the genus Triguira, and it's now called Selenum herculeum after the Straits of Hercules. So this is something that's a very interesting, very cool looking plant. It's very closely related to these um, Selenum trisectum and nava, and it also has tiny little horns on its anthers. So all of these form a lineage, which is a new, a new set of relationships, which hadn't been revealed before we, we started to look using a lot more species and more DNA sequences. But the last of these is the moreloid clade. Now this is what I'm actively working on right now. And so I'm actively pulling my hair out about these species at the minute. And in 2015, we first produced um, a phylogenetic work looking at these, at these plants. And this is the Selenum nigrum group. And this, is, this has really baffled people for, for many years and has caused all kinds of headaches. And lots of the synonymy in Selenum comes from within this group. And this is partly because they are globally distributed, they're weeds of agriculture, and they also have polyploidy. So there's varying degrees of either allo and or auto polyploidy in the origins of many of these species. So we did this first uh, phylogeny to try to kind of target, target our work in, in monographing things and realized that it was, that actually there's a very large clade, which we call the black nightshade clade, and all of the polyploids go together here, all the African species of polyploids, and then there's various South American ones. And then there are two other lineages, which are part of this larger moreloid group, one of which we call the radicans clade, and the other of which I, we call the eposarcophyllum clade. So thinking about how to, how to kind of do this monographically, we decided that what we'd do is we'd split up this group geographically, because in any particular area, there are a lot of introduced species. And so and so to have, to have the, the 80 or 90 species as a single monograph isn't gonna help anyone who's in Europe, who's really only dealing with, um, with three or four, three of which are, are introduced. So we first produced a, a revision of the old world black nightshades and there, there we had 19 total species and only 12 of them were native. And this includes Africa, 
Eurasia, um, Australia, and Southeast Asia. So this includes everything outside the Americas. And the next one we did was um, a revision of the clade in North and Central America and the Caribbean. Again, because in North America, there are a lot of introduced species which have come from, from Europe and from Asia. And so identification of these would be easier treated on a regional basis. And we're now, just now, just about finishing the treatment of the um, South American ones. Now the, the uh, North and Central America and the Caribbean monograph included 18 species, only 10 of which were native. But South America has 63 species, all of which are native. So that's a much bigger thing um, in total. So I just wanna take you through these kind of three areas just to show you some of the diversity that's associated with our plain bog standard weed, Selenum nigrum, which everybody pulls up out of their gardens and is very upsetting to me. So in Africa, this, oh, so, oh no, first I wanted to just, I forgot I was gonna do this. Um, I wanted to just show you some of the characteristics that we use to dis differentiate between the species, because these are all, all of these plants were called Selenum nigrum. So most of, most of these plants have been called Selenum nigrum in herbaria. And so separating them out is an absolute nightmare without actually going and looking at thousands and thousands of herbarium specimens. So when we did the, the um, North and Central America and Caribbean monograph, we had looked at 10,000 herbarium specimens of the taxa that we had treated in that monograph. That's a lot of herbarium specimens. So this is the distribution of the group. And again, like Selenum in general, it's most diverse in the Andes. It's an Andean thing. And the characters that we use are things like size. And this is the anthers. This is Selenum americanum, which is a, which is a, is a weed which sometimes gets into Britain, but mostly, mostly is, in southern, is in the southern part of Europe. But these anthers are less than a millimeter long. So the differences between two millimeters and one millimeter can tell you whether it's one species or another. There are other characteristics that go with that as well, but, but it's tiny little differences which tell these, these species apart. The, the position of the calyx lobes in fruit and the color of fruits is also important. This is Selenum americanum, which has these highly reflexed calyx lobes. This often disappears in herbarium specimens. So it's, sometimes it's a bit of guesswork trying to, trying to figure this out. This is Selenum memphiticum, which is a, a, an African species, and the calyx lobes in this species are tightly oppressed to the top of the fruit and never reflects like they do in Selenum americanum. And the other important characteristic that we've used is, um, is the number of stone cells in each of the fruits. So in, in the fruits of these plants, you get seeds, here are the seeds, these big ones, and you also get these sclerified bodies, and the number of them is consistent within a species. So there's a lot of these really small characters that we've used. In Africa, well, the two groups that sit outside that black nightshade clade are the Episarcophyllum group, which is a really interesting group from, from uh, Argentina that have these underground rhizomatous stems. And people will, would collect these by yanking them up. And so people thought they were annual herbs, but it, actually going out and looking at them, they're not. And then you get this thing called the radicans group, which consists of these rather cute little flowers with really stubby little styles and these fruits which are kind of um, pinched in at the bottom. Someone said they look like bums. They're pinched in, at, pinched in across, the, across the, um, the main septum and are often brightly colored. So these are, these are two groups that are, are there, the early branching lineages in the, in the Morelloids. And then there's another one, which is Selenum triflorum, which is an amphitropical weed. So this is something that occurs both in Southern Argentina and in Southern, South, Southern North America, Southwestern North America. And this is a very common amphitropical pattern that um, many, many species follow. So these, this is the Episarcophyllum group, and here's the radicans clay. So amongst the black nightshades, there, uh, there are many of these species occur in Africa, and these are much used by people in Africa. You often have these old labels from the, from the early part of the 20th century and the late part of the 19th century saying, um, weed around people's fields, but actually these weren't weeds. These are things that people actively cultivate. Selenum scabrum has two different um, body forms for the species. There's one which has very large leaves. This is my colleague Manoko. One has very large leaves and is used as a spinach, as a leaf vegetable. And the other form has um, very large fruits and is used as used for its fruits. The, the form with the large leaves has slightly smaller fruits. So di in, in these African species, dissecting which characteristics had to do with cultivation and domestication and which of these were actually species specific characteristics can be quite difficult. Selenum villosum 
is, um, is a species which we have here in Europe and occasionally occurs in Southern England and it has bright orange fruits and usually only has about four or five, six fruits to six flowers fruits to an inflorescence. But in Eastern Africa, these are selected by children and some of these berries taste like like wild strawberries. They're absolutely delicious. And Tina did a very interesting taste test of these, of these um, black nightshade species, including Selenum nigrum. And the ripe fruits of all of these have very differing flavors and actually are quite delicious. And the, the Selenum villosum are actually selected by children and then, and then they're just spread. And so they get these ones that have very big inflorescences. Selenum retroflexum, this species, is the garden huckleberry, which was, um, which was uh, promulgated by Luther Burbank as being, as being a hybrid that he made, but actually it's just an African species. And Selenum tardi remotum does an interesting sort of thing of releasing the fruit with the pedicel, which is another characteristic which allowed us to tell what these species were. So these are used all over the continent for both fruit, for both their fruits and for their leaves. In Mexico and Central America, there are lots and lots of weeds and they were all called Selenum nigrum as people went across with those railways across the United States or anything that looked like a black nightshade was called Selenum nigrum. So again, dissecting all of this out took a long time. And there are some, some really widespread ones. They also have very widespread distributions. This is a map of this species, Selenum nigrescens, and you can see that it's, it's, it's everywhere around, around the Caribbean. And they, they also have railway distributions. So this is Selenum emulans, which is a, a species with tiny little flowers like Selenum americanum with the anthers less than a millimeter long, um, th but has very different uh, fruits and calyx lobes. And this is mostly in the Eastern part of North America, but has also been found in British Columbia. And it actually is, follows exactly the Canadian Pacific Railway is where these are found. So these, this is a set of species that, that um, we're all called Selenum nigrum. There's a few endemics. There's like Selenum pseudogracile and Selenum emulans and Selenum prunosum and douglasii. So there are all these species that are in fact quite different and are endemic, but we're always lumped under this Selenum nigrum problem. But the real diversity in the, in the Moreloids comes in South America. And I've just put a collage of a few of these together and they may not look like something that anyone but a mother could love, but I think these plants are absolutely fascinating. There's ones that look very similar to Selenum nigrum, Selenum aloysifolium is a large tree. There are annuals, Selenum annuum. There is a one with yellow flowers. There's the tiny Selenum wedelii. There's Selenum sinuati recurvum, which has flowers about two centimeters across and fleshy little leaves that grows in sandy areas way high up in the Andes. Selenum fibrigii, which has these campanulate corollas, don't, doesn't look like a black nightshade at all. Um, some glandular species like this one, grandidentatum and tweedianum. And then the diversity amongst these and the hyper variability within a single plant can really drive a botanist crazy. So here's Selenum cochabambensi from Peru. And these are all leaves off a single stem. So very, very different sizes and different toothing on the margins. And these are flowers from a single inflorescence. So the size of the flower can be very, very different depending on how it develops, how much water it gets, whether it's in the sun or in the shade. And so dissecting some of this from herbarium specimens can be a massive problem. And this probably takes the cake for the most variable one of all. This is Selenum salicifolium, which has about 10 synonyms, each of which is based on a differing leaf shape. And these two leaves are adjacent leaves from a single stem. So dissecting all of that out has proved very difficult and has quite been quite time consuming, but really fun because it's involved quite a lot of field work and finding things in the field. But also working in the herbarium has been really important and particularly in local herbaria. This is my colleague, Gloria Barbosa, with whom we're writing this series of monographs and working with her collections, which are very, very good for, for Argentina, which is a real center of diversity for this, um, for this group. We can, we can really get a handle on the distribution and things. And actually going in the field to look for things that are very rare and unusual. And this is something called Selenum cone carensi which um, is known from a single population. We dug, and it's rhizomatous and, and is all over this one little hillside. We dug up a tiny bit to cultivate it back in the, um, in the herbarium, in the greenhouse in the herbarium. 
And we had initially, from our early DNA studies, we thought that this was a member of the moreloid clade. Because we'd never seen fruits, and there were very few specimens in flower. But we found it this last time, last, last year at this time, we found this plant. And you can see here, it's got that very characteristic pedestal sleeve in our most recent DNA phylogenies, including this species. This belongs to the dulcomaroid clade, which is not a surprise looking at its flowers and looking at that pedestal sleeve. So it was exciting to get this in fruit for the first time and to find out something new about it. Turns out Gloria has kept that plant alive and um, is trying to cross it, but it's, it's highly, um, highly self-incompatible. So it, it needs another, it, there are obviously two individuals of this on this hillside. But going, going in the field doesn't necessarily mean going to kind of exciting jungles and really beautiful, pristine habitats. There is a lot of diversity in, in Solanaceae in particular, as people from the BSBI will well know, Solanaceae tend to occur in disturbed areas. And this is true for the native species in South America as well. And this is the recent trip last February where we were looking for a couple of different new species and going to these very highly anthropogenically changed habitats, but also very dry areas. And actually some of these species are probably more endangered than one would think, partly because they're not collected very often because everyone drives right through these areas and doesn't think they're interesting because they're all headed to the rainforest. But also because the, the, the road verges aren't being kept up as areas for plants of particular interest, particularly in, um, in Cordoba, in Argentina, where, where a lot of the really interesting sand duny type habitats are being leveled and planted for um, in peanuts for peanut butter. And here we found this particular new species, which we described earlier this year, called Selenum marmoratum. It's called marmoratum because of the marbled fruits. This is the ripe fruit. And these are, again, minutely tiny flowers. And unlike Selenum concurrency, this is completely self-compatible. We had this, um, a single plant of this in a, in a pot and every single flower set fruit and there was no other plant of this around. So this is, this is highly self-compatible, but very, very rarely collected and rarely found probably because its habitat in these areas of, um, of um, dry forest is highly endangered. Dry forests are much more endangered than our wet forests in South America. So actually, it's really important to remember, and this is a quote from 2014, and I'm sure Chris will, um, will agree, that, that, that it's really important in this time of really fast environmental change that getting the specimens, curating those specimens, and making those data available so people can use them to create policy, to look at, to look at, at changing you know, um, environmental policy, conservation policy is actually should continue to be a priority. But, you know, these selenums have taken me amazing places in the world, not only to collections, but also in the field. And, and it is it is quite exciting. And you and I hope that I've been able to convince you that some of those some of those some of those lineages, which we think of as being very boring here in England, actually have an incredible amount of diversity elsewhere in the world. And that 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 small amount of diversity we have, we can we can recognize here, actually is part of something much bigger, like they say in the HSBC adverts. So I just want to thank all the people who funded all of this work. But actually, what who I'd really like to thank is this extraordinary set of colleagues, all of whom have contributed to this work in all kinds of ways, and we form a group of people who basically don't do anything by ourselves anymore. We do everything together. So thank you very much. And I'll leave you with a picture of, Sal of Nevalo Salcantay, which is one of the tall mountains outside Cusco and one of the great um, sacred mountains of the Incas. Well, thank you very much indeed, Sandy, for that both illuminating and illuminated talk. I'm sure there will be lots of questions. So rather than me asking anything, I'll, I'll open it up to the, the audience of members. So yeah, sorry if I went on too long. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that's one of the wonderful things about uh, an open-ended Zoom meeting. We don't mm -hmm. need to worry about how long the speakers um, speak for. We can just give you a full amount of time. There's no train to catch to get home uh, or anything like that. Although traditionally we would like to go to the pub 
afterwards. Yeah, well, that's not possible tonight. That's not possible. Yeah, Pete says he Pete says he'd like to take go with me to Argentina. I'd like to go to Argentina. <laughs> Let's um, see. I think there are some chat questions. If I can, I find. can't see them. I can't see any of them. Um, at the moment, I've just got excellent talk down. Am I keep trying to? No, oh, that's right. I've got the right button there. Um, uh, do you know, so Liz McDonald's asked, do I want Slatum nigrum specimens sent to me? And I think the thing is that, that um, we probably don't need any more specimens of Slatum nigrum, and they are highly variable with leaves. I mean, you get leaves that are, that are toothed, you get leaves that are glandular, you get, you get um, but they're all mixed up. They're all the same thing. And, and, and what's actually driving that leaf variation is really interesting. And the way you can tell whether it's Selenium nigrum or something else is to measure the anthers because the anthers are two millimeters long in Selenium nigrum and, um, and not so long in Selenium americanum, which is the thing it gets confused with. And Selenium americanum is actually involved in the, in the um, parentage. So the thing to do is to take a picture and record it as a, as a record, but be sure to measure the anthers or to look at, look at those calyx lobes and record that as well, because that will allow us to tell what it is. Because if people just record Selenum nigrum, it might be one of these really interesting things that comes in. Um, lots and lots of these species from North America and from South America have come to Britain on wool waste, and uh, and so and so you get them in you get them popping up in places. And do you recognise the two subspecies of Selenum? No, I don't nigrum. believe it's in. I don't do subspecies. I can't remember more than two things at once. <laughs> No, no, no. The subspecies are the glandular one and the non-glandular one. But when you look at the when you look at them at a population level in DNA, um, they're completely mixed up. They don't form two monophyletic groups. All right. So, so the so the turning on and off of the glands is is really interesting, and um and and how and th that's true of Selenium villosum as well. Selenium villosum has glandular and eglandular forms. So is that just like blue eyes and brown eyes? Well, it could be. I mean, we don't really know about about. Um, there's there's been a lot of work on trichome development, um, uh, in 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 tomatoes in particular, because each of the each of the each of the wild species of tomatoes has a different smell. So the Galapagos one, for example, smells like limes, and the cultivated tomato smells like cultivated tomato. <laughs> but um, yeah, so so there's the, so there's a lot of interest in the in the in the terpenes. There are terpenes. That are produced in the glands. And so sometimes we have things that are glandular and things that are eglandular, and we think they might be the same, but unless we actually know that they're all mixed up, we, we, we tend to call them separate species. Wendy also asks, is, is there any evidence in the fossil record for Salonum nigrum, I guess? Um, well, actually, um, a postdoc who was working with me and has just gone to Colorado, Rocio Deana, who took the picture of Camisaraca villosa, um, she has been looking at seeds, at fossil seeds um, from all over Europe, collections all over Europe. I mean, the thing about the fossil record, which is really interesting, is we have a really good fossil record, as does, um, uh, you know, from the London clay and things, but it's not very old. And so you get seeds which look like selenum seeds, but whether they're selenum nigrum seeds or not, it's impossible to tell. Okay. It's impossible to tell. But you do, so we've been looking at seeds um, to try to redate the phylogeny because our phylogeny, um, there's, a, there's a fossil that's been discovered in Argentina of an inflated calyx, like a, like a ground cherry. Um, and it, it, it pushes the dates way back um, for, for the family, but it also pushes the dates for the rest of angiosperms way back as well. So we're trying to, to get more than a single fossil into that analysis. And so what she's been doing is she's been taking lots and lots of pictures and doing measurements of all these seed fossils, which have come from Berlin and St. Petersburg and Italy and our own collection at the Natural History Museum. It's been a real challenge during the pandemic because she arrived, she arrived in London, Rocio, in February of last year and has had to basically do all this complicated work around the pandemic, but she's amazing and has managed to do it. So um, she's now in Colorado. Is that a technical question from Mike Roberts, or is I think it's technical? Are micro RNA suppression methods used generally for plant color variation? Um, I don't. I I I don't. I don't. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I actually don't know the answer to that. I don't. I don't know. I know that um, 
And what's interesting about the RNA, microRNAs is it was discovered in plants long before the small RNAs were discovered in animals, but the people who discovered them in animals got the Nobel Prize. Highly unfair. Plant mm. blindness. <laughs> and Mary Dean asks, how common is speciation by hybridization in southern ACI? And is it happening now? Well, it's, I, I, think, I think hybrid, the thing about hybridization is um, I kind of feel like there's two, there's two ways of looking at the world. You can look at all variation as being variation or variation as being a problem and due to hybridization. And I think that the speciation by hybridization um, is probably going on at the alloploid level. So in Nicotiana, for example, there are, um, tobacco is probably less than 200,000 years old, the species. Nicotiana tobacco. It's really hard to, to document the alloploid origin of something. So that alloploidy probably goes on a lot. And it's going on, it certainly is, has happened in the black nightshades because all of those African species are, are allopolyploids. Some of them are autopolyploids, which, so it turns out probably Selenum nigrum might be an auto, an allopolyploid of Velosum plus America, it's all very complicated. And so we don't really know very much about those because their chromosomes are teeny weeny little things, unlike tobacco, which has bigger chromosomes that you can paint um, with, with, uh, with chemicals and show them. But I think probably hybridization, I know that potatoes, for example, um, Jack Hawkes, who was the great um, potato taxonomist from the early part of the 20th century, he felt that there were, um, that there was rampant hybridization in potatoes. Whereas my colleague David Spooner has a much broader species concept and he, he encompasses that hybridization as a problem within the variation within a species. So, so figuring out how much hybridization is going on is, um, is quite difficult. There's a hybrid that does occur here in the British Isles um, that Alan Leslie described, which is um, Selenum cross -pro procurens, which is a hybrid between Selenum nigrum and the diploid Selenum nitidi baccatum, which came from, it's a South American wool waste weed. And, and you get that in Cambridgeshire and Bedfordshire and a couple of other places. It's really hard to tell from Nigram though. Yeah, well, I, I think you've opened our eyes up to a, a whole new world. The wonderful um, world of Selenums. I mean, they're amazing. <laughs> and, and we're going to have to look much more closely at those scruffy plants um, that are, are growing in well, the another fun thing another fun thing to do so 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 selenium nigrum is super interesting actually because um it occurs in in europe where it was described from europe and it's pretty homogeneous i mean you know within the kind of leaf shape variation thing but it's pretty homogeneous in europe but it also occurs all the way east to china and i think nigrum is an Asian plant which was brought to Europe and Selenum villosum is the other way around. It's a European plant which went east. And so you get these two different things because in um, one of the things that, that happens is um, the things that people use, the plants that people use don't have stone cells. So the ones, the ones that people eat tend not to have those sclerid bodies in it, which is not surprising because you'd probably you know, save the seeds of something that didn't have those nasty little hard things in them. So um, the European, the Selenum nigrums that we have here are, are, don't have stone cells. But in North America, you get Selenum nigrum on the East Coast, which has come from Europe, and you get it on the West Coast, which I think has come from China. But I haven't, I need to, so I need money to do DNA stuff to figure that out. So there's lots mm -hmm. of unanswered questions. You know, my goal is to just do the taxonomy at a, at a common level across the group across the whole genus and then and then have you know set up problems for other people to look at uh, and i'm sure some of the younger um, viewers and listeners will be the ones that solve those problems oh yeah absolutely so absolutely. There, there's and something there's for everybody to do there's new techniques all the time as well which is really fun because you can apply these new techniques to questions that seem insoluble and then you actually get somewhere like like edeline is doing with the with looking at this kind of unresolved, what we call the unresolved backbone of selenum. It just is unresolved. Well, thank you once again, Sandy. Well, thank you very much for letting me, letting me talk about my moreloids. <laughs>